Jeff, that truly, truly resonates. And I mean, it's the perfect segue to introduce quickly Ted Rao to talk towards inclusion of all voices in the system, sociocracy and beyond. So we'll just move the spotlight and put Ted Rao in the middle of the audience. The floor is yours, Ted. Hello, everybody. I decided not to do slides today because change of pace. So my name is Ted Rao, another guy today, I noticed that. And I'm a big fan of ProSocial, yes, so that was mentioned just now. And I'm also one of the co-founders of Sociocracy for All. We're a nonprofit of about 160 af uh, active members in decision-making globally, and about 16 of them are in paid roles. And we're growing, and we're growing more and more actually into being a platform, which we didn't thought we would do in the beginning. But the interesting thing for me for today is that before I was doing sociocracy consulting and training, I was a teacher and researcher for linguistics, and I studied syntax and semantics, structure and meaning. And language has always fascinated me, because if I have an idea in my mind, I can take the concept, map them onto words, right, linearize those words into a well-formed sentence following certain rules, which is syntax. And then you hear the sentence, decipher it, and concepts form in your mind that will be pretty close, at least, to what was in my mind. And all the richness inside of our inner world and transmitting some of that into someone else's brain, that's pretty cool. And then I noticed one thing, and that is that there's one big problem with language because it's only a tool that works when it's one mind that is trying to communicate with one other mind. So one brain talking to one brain. Like right now, my brain, with a lot of other things, is talking to your brain. And you might say, wait, there's many of us listening right now. True. But I'm talking to you independently. Your brain is um, processing what I'm saying independently of each other. So I'm not talking it to a collective right now. I'm talking to a set of individuals right in this moment. So then I was wondering, how does one talk to a collective? Let's say, for example, I want to approach a collective. I want to go talk to an online bookstore. Let's say, so that's a collective, right? And let's say I want to complain because I was charged twice for my purchase or something like that. Then I'm not sending an email to a dear company, you know, like the organization. I'm sending an email to, let's say, billing at bookstore or whatever. So I need to talk to roles or departments in the organization to talk to an organization, right? And that's what an organization is, obviously. It's not an homogenous group of people. It's a structure, right? And turning a set of individuals into roles and departments, that's what governance is. That's what it does. So I realized, huh, maybe governance is what we need to effectively talk to a collective. But it also works the other way. For example, if I speak for a group, for a collective, you could say, oh, that's many minds talking and like putting out a shared statement, for, for example, like a public announcement. Like, yes, true, but what do you need in order to send out a public statement in the name of an organization? You would either have to write it with your group and approve it in that group, or you would have to empower one person to speak for everybody. So you need governance again. There is just no way to talk from a collective outwards without governance. So I realized, oh, that's exciting. Language is to align individuals like brain and brain kind of, and governance is to align individuals with collectives or collectives with individuals, and maybe also collectives with collectives. So just like a sentence is not a random pile of words, right? It has structure, like grammar puts words and concepts into relationships that make it possible to make meaning. So it's the packaging into responsibilities and the relationships to each other that make it possible for me to talk to an organization and so on, also within an organization. And I know that Simona and, and team uses the word grammar as well. I was excited to see that. And it's very close to what, how I think about it. And also Eleanor Ostrom, the basis of both socials work, right? Talked about institutional grammar in those words. And I was super excited when I saw it. And um, it's one of my secret dreams to like take it, improve it and adapt it and make it usable for everybody. Because I think that in self-organizing, 
every individual needs to know how it works. You can't just plan it top down. So the languages that we have right now are not enough to do what we want to do. We desperately have to learn how to speak governance, basically, that next level of um, being a collective. And also that's why everybody needs this and you can't just centralize it. And that's why our nonprofit, our purpose is to make these um, design principles like sociocracy accessible to everybody. So a few thoughts just on uh, that connection between kind of design principles that I think we will need. And some of those, or all of those actually we've been playing with in our own organization. So our basic unit and organization, and by that I mean an entity that has a purpose and a shared identity and some centralized parts. Most networks have that too, platforms and so on. The organization is the part that is holding those centralized parts. And then the govern governance language that made most sense to me was sociocracy based on roles, circles, consent, sociocracy and holacracy, all related forms of decentralized governance. Um, we have tools that make it really easy to build those modular systems and make sure we let each unit and subunit self-organize, but we also have alignment between the pieces where it's needed using consent to check for alignment. So the language for one organization is pretty clear to me. And I know there's still work to do out there a ton, but what I'm thinking about is what's what's the next step? If we compare it to learning language, so we can now build sentences using recursive patterns, interfaces, just like languages, what comes next? But before I do that, I want to show you something really quick. And it comes, it's probably pretty exciting to me and for you, it might just be a stray fact in your day. But this is what I did in my previous career. This is a syntax tree. This is the inherent structure of a sentence. So you see there's some hierarchy to it, but this is not power over hierarchy. It's just that things are part of each other. There's a, like a natural thing. And this is actually the theory of Noam Chomsky was that universal grammar is kind of the pre-structured thing that we have in our brain that we're born with that makes us learn and speak languages fairly easily. All you need to do is find out what language it is that you are actually born into and then you speak that. So that was exciting to see of like, oh, I'm actually still doing the same thing. There, there I am again doing linguistics after all. So, and by the way, this is natural language, right? So this is, this is natural or like languages are, at least natural languages are a natural thing. Um, so now if we have one organization and all the modular systems of self-organizing, adapt, grow, shrink, improve, all locally and with the consent of the people who work in it. But now how do we build something beyond organizations? How do you go beyond single sentences? How do you connect sentences? And let's say, for example, um, like I, I'm in the role of external contact in Sociocracy for All, so I get to talk a lot to other people, other organizations. And then quite often people say, oh, we should collaborate. And then I typically ask them, what do you mean? Like, tell me exactly what that looks like, because collaborate is kind of such a buzzword. I want to know what they mean. And often they don't have an answer because they feel they're like gravitating towards something. But making this happen, collaboration between organizations, that's quite something. Because I know our organization is complex, it's an ecosystem, and your organizations will be too, right? So what does collaboration mean? Uh, it's easier to say than to do. It's um, Sometimes I joke, it's a little bit like walking up to somebody and saying, hey, I love your foot. I love your foot. Can I have it? You know, it just doesn't work that way because it's all grown together in a way. There's some modularity to it, but that's limited. So I was thinking a lot about how can one organization partner with another whole organization? What does it mean? Is it like getting married? You know, like what, what, what do we mean when we say that? Do we now do everything together or do we just say we're partners, but we do everything separately? Like, what does it mean? You know, that's, that's one of the big questions for me. So to me, that's like having two complete sentences that have an unclear relationship to each other. What do we mean? Is one a subset of the other and so on? And of course, collaboration, and I know that's been talked about here, uh, might be a contract between small units. For example, our marketing team partners with the marketing department of another organization, either short term or long term, or we partner to put on an event. And the tricky thing about that partnerships as contracts is that it means that partnerships can now exist on all levels of the organization. 
So it can be a little bit like in that syntax tree, it can connect like, like um, yeah, be, be put into, plugged into all kinds of levels of the sentence. And that's because that's what happens in polycentric decentralized governance, right? So um, we notice that when, for example, our Spanish speaking division wants to do their own partnerships, right? And then maybe a subset of them and so on, that gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. And what we do is we just blueprint it of like, this is what a partnership means for us. But that now means that everybody needs to understand those patterns of this is what a partnership means and go do it because it's not one central place doing it. And that means now it's really like everybody has to acquire governance like we all acquire languages. You can't just centralize one area where then um, a language happens. It's free, it evolves, it's not owned, right? But everybody acquires it and speaks it. And I think that if we spoke governance a little bit better, it would help us have more clarity about how to do things. And I think that we're still very much at the beginning there. So in my sense, this is just kind of a, a in in um, complete metaphor, but I guess it's like we're still talking in sentences, complex sometimes, but we haven't like put them into meaningful paragraphs because I don't think we understand how to do that. For example, I see that a lot in national organizations with the local chapters, they they often build like these big councils and they don't even say what this group is for. They just say, oh, they should meet, right? But do they make decisions? Or is that like, is it an organ or is it a connective tissue? Is this like an impact group, what we heard earlier, just for sharing? That's good, but that's different from decision making, right? So for example, for national organizations, it could be that the power is on the local level and that the national group only meets for sharing and alignment and connection. Or we could have the opposite. We could have a national organization where the decisions are made on the national level and the local chapters are just chatting and sharing. Or we could build hybrids where some of the decisions are on the top and only sharing happens locally on that topic and vice versa for some other decisions. So I think we could build much more elegant ways that unleash more power and, and more creativity for people because we are more clear about what is, what is for what really. The question is always who decides, right? Who decides and where does information flow? And not every group is the same just because you have a group of people. So, so far, what I've talked about is what um, governance is like a language. We need it for collectives, like we need language for communication. And also everybody needs to learn a language so we're more clear about our groups and their functions and so on. But then what comes after building paragraphs? And I've been very curious about that because I was struggling with um, how we could represent the ecosystem more. And we heard some things about that and I was, weighing what I was going to say about that. So it's pretty clear that in an ecosystem, we have customers, suppliers, investors, shareholders, alumni, the workers, families, and they're all integral parts of the ecosystem, right? For example, if I fire or we fire a colleague, they might not be able to afford the private school for their kids anymore. So us firing that person has a ripple effect on the school, which itself have, it might have a ripple effect on the school's employees, family, and their nanny, you know, like it goes, it's, so I guess we all noticed that um, or learned it the hard way in this pandemic, right? How everything is connected. Like if the pandemic closes my kid's school, then I can't go to work. So in a way, my workplace is a stakeholder in the school. So how does one hear and sense a whole ecosystem? Um, and I don't think, by the way, voting is a good pattern um, because in large, group, so in large groups, people always resort, resort to voting using majority vote because groups are too big to be run by consent. But majority vote can so easily divide people into winners and losers, and it loses so much information. All the nuances get drowned out. And I think we need to hear as much as possible to make sustainable decisions, because if we ignore half of what's going on or ignore a whole group of people, our decisions won't last. So we need to move away from one, one member, one vote, or even one shareholder, one vote, and so on, and learn to map perspectives. And that's another thing came up today already. For example, if we use the AI-driven polling, like it's done in Taiwan, the term that, that I learned from there is listening at scale. I absolutely love that. And um, so the idea is there that we listen to what's happening in the ecosystem in a way that can be automated and then create choices from there. And that can then be decided in the decision-making body. So it's that 
interplay between the ecosystem and the perspectives at play and a decentralized decision making that I'm really excited about. And now, if we have a whole novel, like a whole story, it's made up of words, but in order to write a story, you just don't just throw a lot of sentences onto a page, right? So, and that's a little bit what we do when we vote, really. So instead, you need to understand the relationships between the thoughts and the narratives and the groups and so on. That's what a narrative is. It has a logic. So, and I think none of those challenges ahead of us can be solved alone or by one organization or even one movement alone. So we have to learn how to align our units with other units and our organizations, with other organizations, ecosystems, with the wider ecosystem and so on. And I think that the language we need in order to do all that is governance. I really don't believe it. I've never experienced it.